Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Tech Connect Podcast. I'm John Martin. And I'm Dean Reverman. Dean, uh, you know, we've talked a few times about the impact of technology mm-hmm. in our in our world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, our channel, obviously, we talk channel. about that every week. Yep. Yep. But we've talked about it in the world, too. We had an episode all about, like, technology, pop culture. Yes, right? yes. We, well, that one was kind of focused on, hey, there's, you know, how technology looks in pop culture, mm-hmm. movies, television, yep. and yep. how it may or may not influence our, our you know, our world. Right. But today, we're going to kind of take that into a different place, and we're going to talk about how tech, the real tech, not mm-hmm. just the stuff we see in the TV shows. Not science the fiction. Future, yeah, the yeah. futuristic tech, how real tech shapes and changes our society. Yeah. Uh, we have a great guest with us today. We have Gene Halsey from Microtouch. He's mm-hmm. a, a bit of a pioneer in that world and yep. understands the world of technology, understands how it impacts us. So mm-hmm. we're going to dive a little bit of that topic. We're going to talk about the relationship between technology and humanity. Uh, maybe you know a little bit about our obligation when it comes to technology. You know, mm-hmm. it's you know it's not always fun and games and, and roses for everybody <laughs> everywhere to have that kind of access. Uh, and we're also going to talk about what's changed about technology in the last year. Obviously, a lot of innovation oh, had to occur. Man. We've talked yeah. about it quite a bit. Yeah. And then maybe a little bit about some industries that are, are benefiting from mm-hmm. some technologies that Gene's very familiar with, like on the touch side of things. Man, lots so, to cover today. That's right. Again, another one good one queued up. Exactly. No uh, doubt. Uh, we wouldn't bring anybody a bad episode. I mean, right? come on. Yeah, come on. That's what we strive to do. <laughs> All that plus our usual value to the VAR and what's tech connecting with us. It's time to plug in and get connected. Welcome to the Tech Connect Podcast. It's time to get connected. All right. As I mentioned, our guest today is Gene Halsey. Gene is the VP of Product and Business Development for Microtouch. Gene, welcome to the show. Uh, you know, I want to start off let you tell us a little bit about yourself, your kind of history with Microtouch and in the channel, and you know, maybe a little bit of your insight into the world of technology. Sure. No, thanks guys for having me. It's a it's a pleasure to be on. Look forward to the topic, and I think we've got some good conversations ahead of us. I've been doing touch now for about 26 years. I got started in it, uh, having come out of the automotive industry and was focused on the material science side originally. So doing all of the coatings and all of the the background, if you will, of, of touch screens, when touch screens were something that no one knew anything about, mm. right? We were supplying touch out to Microtouch. We were supplying touch to Elo. You know, it, it was basically the three companies that I was with at the time. The, we were the touch screen industry and no one knew what we were. Right. I had to always explain to people what a touchscreen was and how they would use it. And and it really wasn't until, you know, years later that touch became as ubiquitous as it did. And and I got hooked up with TPK, uh, who was a pioneer in projected capacitive touch and developed the first touch panel for the Apple iPhone. Um, and from there on, I mean, you kind of guys know what the rest of the story is, right? Right. But touch took off. Now touch is ubiquitous. It's it's in all ways that we interact with with the world around us and uh, very excited now to bring this full circle with Microtouch, have the opportunity to to go in and bring that into the channel and be able to bring these projected capacitive solutions out to a vast, vast audience. So yeah. looking forward to what we can do. You know, one of those technologies, when you think about it, I mean, just where would we be today without tech, touch technology? And yet, we are all obviously old enough to remember the days. And we didn't We have didn't it. have it. And, oh, yeah. And, and, and I know we all love that we do. You know, we've reached this point where we're like, hey, this is awesome. We love having this. But again, I also do think back about, you know, science fiction and those of us that were interested in science fiction. Right. We've seen this stuff. Right. If you watch Star Trek, if you watch science fiction shows, you saw all kinds of tech. They had whole panels, you know. Although, to be right. fair, sometimes I feel like our touch tech and where we are right now is actually looks better and is cooler mm-hmm. than even what you saw like, yes. on science fiction shows yeah. 20 or 30 years yeah. ago. So, you know, yeah, it's awesome that we're here. And, uh, and Gene, it's awesome that we have you here as someone who who understands that uh, that kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, the mythos versus the reality mm-hmm. of, of touch tech and where, <laughs> where we've come. So so then, you know, let's let's dive into our conversation. Let's talk about this idea of how technology shapes society. And I want to I want to start with this relationship between technology and humanity. And I think we've kind of hinted to this already just in our intro here that a technology can very quickly become ubiquitous in part of our lives. We can't imagine a world without touch. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you handed somebody, especially someone who is a younger generation, someone oh, in man. their 20s or even early 30s, if you handed them a not smartphone that didn't have a touch screen on it, <laughs> they would... It, 
you might as well be handing I've seen them the a videos. brick. I've seen the videos. I've seen the videos. What do I do with this? Yeah. You yeah. might as well be handing them like a literal brick and just telling them to make a phone call <laughs> with it or something. Well, first of all, they be also, they'll, they'll probably also go, what's a phone call? You right. Know, like, yeah. Can I text with it? Like, oh, no, you can't My do that My kids either. do not use their phone as a phone. Yeah, exactly. It, they rarely do that. Exactly. So so let's talk about this idea of, you know, do do we adapt and create technology for us, or does technology compel us to change and adapt? Like, it, it's a chicken and the egg kind of thing. I mean, mm. you had to start somewhere, mm -hmm. but, you know, at this point, where like, where's the influence happening? Is it us figuring out what technology we need to do what we want to do, or is it that we kind of make the technology and then find a way to insert it into our lives and into our reality. No, I mean, from our perspective, I think, I think we're adapting to the things that are around us and trying to develop technologies that, that fit those needs. Right. And sometimes those take a long time, right? Again, if I go back to, to the Genesis of Microtouch, I mean, I can trace the story back into the early 1980s, right? When the first, actually the first commercial touchscreens were available in 1979 when they did 200 screens for the Library of Congress to digitize the card catalog. You know, want to talk about things that people don't know what they are anymore, digitizing a card catalog, right? <laughs> or a card um, catalog, so that, that's right. as far, Right, exactly, right? So that's as far back as this goes. And for, for years, it was just something that kind of plotted along out there, and people really didn't know what to do with it. And it took innovators, it took pioneers, it took people to reach out and say, wow, we could really do something different with this technology. And some of those epically failed. Right. I mean, mm. if I look back at 2001, you take someone like Palm, right? Palm came out with that first Palm pilot, the first per personal digital assistant, yeah. right? All of a sudden there was this rash of investment that came into the industry. This was going to be the transformative product, right? And within 18 months, they were gone. Right? Yeah. The actual usefulness of that technology didn't pan out to be what people thought it would be, right? And it wasn't until Apple came around in 2007 with the iPhone right? That that really became the the inflection point, right? The paradigm shift that brought the technology into a way that we could consume it in the way that we always envisioned. And what I find fascinating is if you go back to those days when, when Steve Jobs came out and announced the iPhone that January, if you look at the press from January to June when the iPhone was originally released, there's probably 50%, if not a little more than 50% of the press that was out there that said, what business does Jobs have doing this, right? <laughs> Apple had just come back from the dead. The iPod was the hit, mm -hmm. right? Everyone was loving what the iPod, what business does Apple have getting into this space? The mm -hmm. Razor, 2006, Motorola was crushing it, right? Mm -hmm. The Razor was the best selling phone of all time. They couldn't make enough of them, long backlogs, right? right? All of this. Here he comes with something that you want to talk about dialing on a brick. That's what that first iPhone felt like. <laughs> Right. It felt like you were dialing on a brick. Yeah. Right. So you had this thin, sleek razor contrasted with this brick and and Steve Jobs saying, This is going to be the transformative product of our generation. Mm -hmm. Right. And obviously it turned out to be so, right? So we we brought that technology forward and and with us. And and what we see now is it takes it takes what I call industrial electronics or vertical market electronics you know, much longer to, to catch up to those consumer trends, mm. right? We're, we're not as fast as ado at adopting those things as consumers are. And I think for good reason, right? I go back to the Palm Pilot. If we all rushed into the Palm Pilot at that time, right? We could have crashed and burned coming out of the other side of it, right? We take time to vet these things and figure out how we're going to use them. Mm -hmm. But now, I mean, to your guys' point, Right, we've got a generation of students that are coming out of high schools, or coming out of trade schools, or coming out of universities, or coming out of all of these work disciplines, that the only way that they know how to interact with information is through touch. Mm -hmm. Right. If mm -hmm. I'm working at McDonald's, right? If I'm working at McDonald's and I'm working in the kitchen and an order comes up and I want to swipe to the next order, I intuitively think that display is going to have touch on it. Right. Yeah. Right. If yeah. I'm working in the cashier at Walmart, I expect my cash register is going to have touch on it. If mm -hmm. I walk into a store and I see a kiosk, I expect that it's going to have touch on it, right? It's become the norm, right? It's become the way that a nurse, she expects her electronic medical records to, to have touch on them, right? It's, it's just the way it is, right? So it's, it's a imperative on us now as an industry to, to give that experience to employees, right? And to our consumers, right? So that's, kind of an evolution of touch over now 40 years. MicroTouch is going to be 40 years old next February, 
right? And, and <laughs> yeah. that phone is 11 years old. So think yeah, about that, yeah. right? Think about that time yeah. that it took technology to evolve. Mm -hmm. You know, you bring up a very interesting point there, which is this idea that when we do adopt a new type of technology, it very quickly becomes ingrained in who we are, what we expect out of all the technology around us. Mm. And I think of even simple little things like uh, my wife handed me her phone the other day and she still got an iPhone 8 and I'm on an 11 now. So mm -hmm. I'm used to no home button anymore, mm -hmm. which I didn't think I was going to be used to because right. every iteration of iPhone up to now had a home had button. That. Yeah. So I'm already used to now to swiping up, you know, the face ID and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I constantly, if, if my wife hands me her phone to do something, I'm like, why? Oh, that's right. I got to use this button thing again. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's amazed me how quick it is that I've already put that aside. I've already said, nope, I don't remember anything there is to know about this whole <laughs> button thing. <laughs> Everything now needs to operate this way. But you're right. You know, If I go into any other situation and there's a screen and it looks like it should be a touch screen, my assumption is I start punching it. And that's yeah. happened to me. I've done that on computers oh, yeah. before. Yeah. Well, I'll go. Why isn't what, this? What, yeah. What's oh, it's oh, I can't do that here. I got oh, I got to use this mouse thing instead. I got to do this instead. <laughs> but you're right; it becomes very in, ingrained in what we what we what we think about with technology, and it's and it's easy to jump in and adapt to it and, and just and run with it. Dean, what it were does. you going to say? Well, well, a couple things there. I mean, I've I've got a car that has you know the first iteration of an LCD screen that's yep. not touch. Right, so anybody right, that gets right. in my car immediately <laughs> starts touching <laughs> it. It's like no, sorry, dude, it's it's a, it's a fail. You know, yes, it's my car. Just a screen in a car. My car is only ten years old. Right, but right. but you know, I thought it was the bomb when I had an LCD in my in my car. But no, yep. it needs to be touched. You know, when you think about it, going back to the original question you posed there, John. You know, do we? What is the relationship of technology and humanity? You know, I think a lot of times, and I was reading an article on it. I think they they phrase the continuum pretty well. You have societal problems, right? And then the, the next iteration on the continuum is a technical solution to that problem and then massive societal change. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, that's that they're they're making the argument really that that human that technology is adopting to humanity's needs, right. if you will. That 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 is the precursor to the technology rather than the inverse, which I think in and then certainly in that episode we came up with solu or I uh, use cases where technology kind kind of maybe wasn't initially serving a societal need, but then did morph into figured it. Out with figured it out. Yeah, 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 right. I mean, maybe going back to the iPhone, yeah, I remember the Razor gene. I mean, I, I it was it was the the bomb. I oh, mean yeah. it was a flip yeah. phone. It was cool. It was thin. It was everything. And then what is this iPhone? I mean, I remember my brother who's an an, an early adapter to technology. It's the first time I ever saw one, and he's like tapping out a message. I'm like, that QWERTY is like, it's on the screen. What are you doing? You can't even type in any way. Um, but what it solved, part of the societal changes or societal problems that it was solving were applications and, and getting it into your workflow and just making life that much easier. And, right. and that's where I think, you know, so there's a technical te technology solution to some society, societal needs that led its way to a massive change, yeah, right, in, in society. Definitely. Yeah. And Gene, I, I'm a sucker for stories like what you just told about the idea of, like, the Palm Pilot, for instance. Mm. There was a whole article I went through that had something like the 30 or 50 tech innovations that went nowhere, failed miserably or mm -hmm, something. And mm -hmm. some of the stuff was stuff that I just literally had never even heard of. Mm -hmm. And some of it was stuff that I would, oh, yeah, I remember that. Like the Zune, the Microsoft Zune, which <laughs> tried to come out and compete, you know, like with the with the iPods and the other MP3 players yes, in the world. Yes, I remember. Failed miserably, did not go well. Although some people <laughs> swore by it, you know, some people love it. Because there's always going to be somebody who gets something. They're all IT this. guys. Yeah, I love yeah, this. Right. right. <laughs> so I, I'm a sucker for those kind of stories, you know, where – you know, an innovation came out at one point and just didn't, wasn't quite what was expected or needed at that time and failed somehow. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, another iteration comes out, you know, four, five, 10 years later, mm -hmm. you know, like the iPhone. And, and again, we all go, eh, I don't know about this. It, it failed the last time. Why is it going to work this time? Mm -hmm. And suddenly becomes the standard, you know, down the road. And now if you, you know, I know like Motorola tried to reintroduce the new Razor again, yes, right. you know, yeah. and, I think we all kind of laughed at it, honestly. Like, you know, it, most people... Like, did most, it even have a touch? I don't know. I, anyway. I think it did. did yeah, it? Okay. I think it did have all a touch right. component, too. I don't, I don't think you can... Yeah, it did? You okay. can't get away with that now, not doing it. But right. yeah, you know, it, it's it's stuff like that where you can't go backwards and try to reinvent what you right. did before. Yeah. So, Gene, I'm just curious, are there any other examples throughout, you know, your life and your history in the world of, of technology where you can think of where there was these those massive shifts like that... Um, just like the iPhone where something, you know, suddenly occurred and there was just a huge technological shift in the way we approach everything. Yeah, I, I think a couple of things there. One, one, I, 
go back to that comment about technology solving a problem, right? And mm -hmm. I think sometimes we get caught in the inverse, right? We we get caught in the idea of creating technology that doesn't necessarily solve a problem because we think it's a good idea or we think it's cool, right? Industry, I'll pick on 3D television, right? <laughs> Millions upon billions of dollars of investment went into 3D television, right? We needed to have 3D TV in our homes, right? You look at 3D movies, they were very popular, lots of people out there, right? We need to bring that in theater experience into our homes, right? And, and we poured all of this money into what it would take to make 3D LCDs to be able to have that in-home experience. And it, the, the problem wasn't there, mm -hmm. right? That problem didn't exist. And yet we went and we put and we, we invested money to try to solve something that society didn't need. Right. And, and you think of those opportunities lost, right? So that's so, a really I, interesting. Yeah. Go ahead, Gene. Yeah. No, I, I think it's, you know, but, but to, to your original question about, do I see other points of this, right? I'll go back to just LCDs in general, right? LCD technology goes back to the early 1970s, late 1960s, right? LCDs, the notion of liquid crystal displays, twisted pneumatic li liquid crystal displays have been around for a long time, but CRTs were the dominant technology right? What was able to finally happen, you know, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, as we moved away from CRTs, and we forced ourselves to get away from that old technology that everyone was very comfortable with. If you guys remember, there was a short period of times where we had something called flat CRTs, mm -hmm. right? Because LCD makers came out, they had flat televisions every, okay, well, we well, as a CRT industry, we, we can do, we can do flat CRTs, right? And we can put touch on those. We can do all those things, right? We don't have to give up our CRT technology. <laughs> there are not any CRT lines, CRT lines left today, mm -hmm. right? So in less than a generation, we've completely obsoleted a technology that was a dominant technology for 80 plus years, right? 70 yeah. plus years, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So those, that's another huge inflection point of, of what's in the industry and what then that LCD technology enabled, right? And what it's brought forward. And now you look at organic light emitting diodes, OLED technology, and, and where we're going to go from here. How quickly are we going to supersede LCDs, right? So there's all of this interweaving that goes on with these technologies that just take years upon years upon years to percolate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's true. When you were talking about the 3D, I was I was thinking to myself, you know, it, because that was one of those technologies was. that was like in Best Buy, you know, oh, you got to get a 3D. Yeah, they all try to insist like this is something you got to have. And I never wanted it, no. if nothing else, because I didn't want to have to wear glasses over glasses. I, well, I think that's that why was, I hate 3D, maybe that's where period. the technology fell apart, right? Is that you had to wear a peripheral then, of some sort. A peripheral yeah. of yeah. some sort or the 3D that was in the screen just wasn't really. No. It's not the same as it being in the there. theater. Right. And, it just, and, and to Gene's point, it just wasn't necessary. It wasn't solving a problem. No right. one was sitting on their couch and going, man, this movie would be so much cooler if, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, you know, those bullets were popping off the screen right. or that character yeah. was, you know, a little bit closer in my face. A 3D is a novelty. It's not something that people looked at and said, I have to experience that. This is the only way I can enjoy movies mm -hmm. from here on out. Mm -hmm. a, a 2D movie will never be good again because mm -hmm. I've seen this. It just wasn't happening. But but maybe VR is going to be the the technological solution to having some kind of immersive experience, right? right? Because what 3D just gets us a little bit closer to an immersive experience as opposed to a flat right, display. Right. Yeah, Gene, I remember <laughs> I remember plasma monitors, right? When those, I mean, who nobody has a plasma screen, but those were some of the the first iterations of a flat panel, yep. uh, if you will. Hey, Gene, I, as you were talking also, I was, I was thinking to myself, take yourself back, you know, 26 years ago when you first started getting into the industry. What were people talking about as it relates to touch? Where did they see, where did you guys see touch going? You know, I, did you see it going into a phone? I mean, I mean, that wasn't, was that on the, was that on the, the whiteboard that, oh yeah, this is where this technology is going to manifest itself or just take us back a little bit. Where, what was ex where did you see the market going at that point in time? Sure. No, I, I think what's interesting is is one of the first things that we got talking about when I got into the industry was what could you do with touch in a vehicle, right? Because mm. touch in a vehicle seemed like a natural extension to provide the driver with more information mm -hmm. and, and a different way to be able to engage as the as the operator of, of the car, right? But the industry pushed back so hard. I can remember being at symposiums in Detroit in, in 2000, 2001, 
right? Having these conversations and the automakers just in just insisting that touch could never succeed in the car because there wasn't any tactile feedback, right? That huh. people were so ingrained at reaching over to turn the knob on the radio, reaching over to slide the dial or slide the slider on, on heat, turn the dial, knob for fan control, whatever right. it may be, right? They wanted that tactile experience with those controls so touch could never work, <laughs> right? And... You know, even to your point, right? Ten years ago, there was LCDs in the car, but there still weren't touch, right? We still right. had to have those 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 knobs and everything to control. It took someone, and again here, right? Like Apple did with the iPhone, it took Tesla coming out with a 17.3 inch screen, right? 17.3 inch in a center cockpit of a car, yeah. right? To really push the envelope of what this technology, what display and touch technology in a vehicle could really do. Mm -hmm. Right. Here's all the other things. Here's how you get a much richer ecosystem around that instead of just the simplicity of volume and temperature control. Right. Tesla said, wow, we can do all of this other stuff in the mm -hmm. car. Mm -hmm. Right. And now I, I would challenge you to find a vehicle that doesn't have touch in the car. Now, it doesn't have maybe a, the extent of what Tesla offers, but you see the automakers going further and further down that path right to somebody being bold enough to step out and say we're going to do something radically different we're going to push back on those norms and those accepted behaviors that have really become ingrained and say we think this is the right way to go and be able to be risk takers yeah. I and mean, that's hard to do i mean it, it was it's, certainly yeah. easier for tesla to do it than it would have been for general motors to do it but. yeah 100 percent. i think that's another iteration of industry not adapting as fast as consumers you yeah. know when it comes to some of these right. technologies and and how it changes society it's it's almost a little bit the inverse here it's like where we were you know if i bought a new car i would expect it to have touch technology and the ability to do all that kind of manipulation right. today you yeah, know as definitely. opposed to even five years ago or yeah. so uh, and that. So yeah. really interesting how that, and you know, I don't know that we'll ever get there that industry does not adapt as fast because as we were talking about in some previous podcasts, you know, there's just this barrier. There's this inertia. It's, it's hard to beat the inertia or get, get the inertia going, I guess, of, <laughs> of people just comfortable with what they have today, right? right? Well, these are the solutions. These are the systems that we have in place. Everything's humming along. Why do I need something new here? So that, that's so hard. And it'll to disrupt and, and just... destroy our company for months if we do try to make right. this change all of a sudden. Right? That's always the, the prevailing thought that pops up, too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Gene, yeah. I, I liked... Um, I, I find it fascinating, and this is why I, I enjoy pe talking to people like you that you know are kind of thinking ahead and seeing a you know a problem resolution where other people don't see it yet. So your example is perfect there. The idea that you know ahead of time you're thinking when when Dean asks you, "Hey, where did you see touch going? Where were you thinking it was going to happen?" and you immediately are thinking automobiles and you know having a touch interface in, in you know for the driver. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you know the the car companies don't want to do that, and the you know and the rest of us are, you know, just struggling with figuring out how to get it into phones and everything else and, and understanding the little bit of basics of it. But I, I find it fascinating that you were thinking about this ahead of time and only and now we're just finally starting to catch up yeah. to that where, you know, as yeah. you mentioned, like now we're finally getting to the point where you can't go out and buy a new car and not have a touch in it of some sort. You, yeah. you, you'd probably laugh at the dealer if they tried to show you something that right. didn't at this point. So I, I, and I think there's a larger story there about the comfort level that occurs in a lot of industries and with just, you know, people in general when it comes to technology. And as you just mentioned, you know, you mm -hmm. get into these industries and you get to just down to the personal people level where we get comfortable with a certain type of technology. And unless you're one of those people that is, you know, always looking to innovation, always willing to try something new, those early adopters that, you know, is happy to get a new gadget and figure it out, that I think that comfort sometimes, whether it is on a a business level, an industry level, or just down to that personal level is what sometimes I feel like holds back technology in our society and keeps us from taking those leaps forward that we could easily do when someone, you know, like a Steve Jobs or an Elon Musk or whoever is out there saying, hey, here's all this cool new stuff we could do. And everyone just goes, eh, backs <laughs> up a little bit, puts their hands up. I don't know if we should be doing that. This is, you're going too far. This is, you're, you're overstepping your boundaries. You know, mm -hmm. you're, this is not who you are. This yeah. is not what your company is. Yeah. And thankfully, there are people who, you know, hear that and go, well, I don't care what you have to say. I'm moving forward anyway, <laughs> because they're the people who then 10 years later, we're all thanking for, you know, whatever new innovation we have that, 
you know, that, that spanking or cursing. Well, or cursing. I mean, well, yeah, could, be, you know. could go either way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you were someone in the world of social media creating that at the beginning, you're probably someone that gets cursed more often than not these days, I would think. So, well, Gene, let's let's kind of shift gears here a little bit, you know, and I, and I kind of want to talk a little bit about, you know, as much as technology has become such a foundational and important part of our society, you hear more and more about the digital divide mm. and the fact that there are, you know, you know, that a lot of times the you know, access to technology and access to all this new cool tech and new innovations out there starts, you know, getting very divided, uh, you know, uh, along, you know, lines of, you know, privilege and, and who has what kind of money and who can do what in society. Um, you know, what, you know, what kind of obligation do we have, especially those of us in the tech world who do get to play with this stuff all the time, uh, to make sure that nobody gets left behind, you know, that, that there aren't people out there who still have to use, you know, an old flip phone because there's just no way they can ever get to the point where they can afford a, a new phone that costs $1,000 or, you know, countries that can't, that don't even, you know, can't even get to broadband, you know, let alone, you know, fiber optic technology or, you know, the the latest generation of, of internet, you know, we're going to be introducing 5G and there's probably, you know, places out there where, you know, even even just basic communications and, you know, of any kind of rapidity at all, mm -hmm. it looks like something we were doing 20 years ago. So what's what is our obligation there? How do we how do we help out with that as, you know, as a species and and maybe, you know, as business leaders as well? It's a it's a great question, right? And it's a it's a challenging question. And and I start with the premise that there should be some baseline of core technology. Right, that there should be some we as an industry, we as as technology leaders, as as business leaders, as you know, there there should be some basic technology that we all support and and we all say that this is a, a basic human construct, right? That that those things should be available, right? And and we make them readily available, you know, in so much as they're they're cost advantageous, they're accessible, they're they're globally available. Right. If you can start there, if there's something that the it, this isn't a net zero game, right? That there is some level up here that there's a base technology that we can operate from as an industry. And then I think we need the government support, right? I think the government plays a big role in this worldwide, right? In in how do we make those things accessible, right? And I think what you're starting to see in some of the school districts, right, with being able to put through tax proposals that bring technology into students' hands, right, that may not have access to them otherwise, right, if they don't have the means to get there. I think what we've done with things like Chromebook, right, where we that is, is kind of a good evidence of a basic uh, technology construct that I think makes computing technology very accessible in, in a way that doesn't put a huge societal burden on people. Uh, those kinds of things, I think, are going to be necessary, right? And Unfortunately, when you when you start to get into to communications, right, it's a big it's a big world, right? It's, it's a huge planet, right? And and how do you get accessibility out to all those reaches? We struggle with it here in the U.S., right? The difference between rural access and and city access, right? In terms of both uh, cellular connectivity and broadband access, right? Even if you go with wires in some way, shape, or form. Right, we're still stuck. I'm in Western Michigan, a fairly developed play part of the world. I still don't have fiber. Right, mm -hmm. we're still struggling as a city of what we're going to do with a fiber rollout. Right, which would transform schools, would transform businesses, would transform other things. Right, I'm stuck on DSL. Right, so if I'm glitching out a little bit here, it's because of DSL. Right, but that's that's technology that's still 15 years old now. Right, that's that's still in here. So. Um, I, I think we, we need to continue to do both sides, right? We have to have a public side in the government and we have to have a, a technology side in the private or the, uh, the corporate sector that says, look, we want to meet in the middle somewhere, right? We want to make these things. We're not looking to make huge dollars off of these. We want accessibility into as many people's hands as we can, right? Because the only way, the only way that we're going to create the next generation of jobs, the next generation of content is through technology, right? Mm -hmm. That the reality of the world that we live in is technology is used to drive our economies. It's used to drive our jobs. It's used to drive our content, right? And if we leave a large segment of the population out of that, we're missing out on the diversity that, that the world has to offer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when you, when you offer some sort of, as you mentioned, like a baseline that you say, Hey, the baseline is everybody should have access to high speed quality internet. You know, let's say that's your baseline mm -hmm. and you pull everybody up to there that wasn't there already. 
all that can do is elevate everything else and everyone else. Mm -hmm. When you have more people that have access to that, you have more people that access. You know, I, I love that you mentioned the schooling thing, and it kind of dives a little bit into our next topic, too, because we the digital divide got exposed in a big way over the last year. Uh, especially when it came mm -hmm. to schools and students, mm -hmm. kids that had to suddenly go home and start doing schooling from home or people that had to work from home, potentially, mm -hmm. if you were in an office job and suddenly finding out, hey, there's people who at their in their home do not have access to Internet, do not have access to the technology they need to just do basic schooling or to do basic work functions. Mm -hmm. and And that's the kind of thing that I look at and say, hey. There's no reason this should be happening. There's no reason. We, we talked about it on another episode before that, you know, I've, I've heard many times this idea of like internet as a utility of sorts, mm -hmm. you know, like we all, we all expect if you have a home, mm -hmm. an apartment, a home, wherever you're living, that you have access to electricity, you have access to water, you know, you, you have those basic necessities. Why would internet not, not be considered one of them at this point in, in this stage in the mm -hmm. world in our, mm -hmm. our technological development? Yeah. Well, I don't know. The answer there is there's still a, some infrastructure cost, unfortunately, is, because yes. even in western uh, Michigan, you know, somebody's got to lay the, f the the fiber on that. It it is an in interesting commentary there, Gene, uh, on the baseline, and it, it's it's one of those things where you know, I don't know. I take a step back and I think about how technology has changed our lives, and there's a lot of good that has come from that. Mm -hmm. But um, but I think that you know, as a society, sure, you know, getting to a point where there is some kind of baseline, because I think Gene's point is is absolutely valid. There's no way we progress if, if people don't have that certain amount of baseline. If they don't have an understanding, if they don't have access uh, to that, how can we progress? They're, they're, they're not. They're, people, you know, certain sections of, of the country won't or the world won't. So they're big problems. I, we're not going to solve them here on this <laughs> podcast. But, we're not? Uh, no. 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 <laughs> but, it, but it is. <laughs> but it's really interesting to, to see that. And, and I'll go back to the fact that also, you know, what you throw in here in, into the mix is just how fast technology evolves. I mean, it is so lightning fast, mm -hmm. which we've also seen during the pandemic. So, so you have these, I don't know, a lot, a lot of uh, gravity uh, going around those types of things as well. And it's like, how does that all get figured out? But yeah, yeah. really interesting. I mean, when you think about uh, technology, how it's changed our lives, you know, you can think about it in, in, in several big buckets. Healthcare dramatically changed. You know, I think healthcare, where it, what it looks like today, the fact that we could have mRNA and have a vaccine roll out as fast as, as it has, unbelievable, even compared to 20 years ago. Uh, these are technological, technological advances. So healthcare is one of the big ones. Transportation, Gene hit, it on, hit on it already. Communications, I mean, communications just just different yeah. uh, today. Um, but, you know, the technology is there where we could do wireless, you know, 5G. It's just a matter of infrastructure and stuff right, like that. Right. Anyway, yeah, really yeah, interesting. Definitely. Well, Gene, I want to kind of get into a little more of your expertise here, too, in the world of touch, because that's, you know, what you live and play in every day. So let's talk about how how touch technology changed over the last year and maybe what's coming up next. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you hear a lot of folks that talk about touch in relation to the pandemic. And obviously, touch became a little bit of a, a literal dirty word, you know, during <laughs> <laughs> during uh, the, the 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 pandemic, because you know we didn't want to touch things as much anymore, and suddenly you know going to a grocery store and touching a you know a, a pad you know right. for your you know, checkout or whatever was yeah. a little little more intimidating than usual. Like I don't you know, who else has been touching this? What have they got? So you know what was your experience with like that over the last year? This maybe like resistance to touch was there was there more expectation like hey how do we figure out how to how to make things even more touchless now while still having the kind of the cool technology we currently have. I can't imagine anyone saying, all right, we need to go backwards and go back to the old days because the old That's days. That's not going to happen. You were still touching stuff then, too. It just right. wasn't a touch you know, right. screen. It was just buttons, you know. So <laughs> so what's that been like in your world? What have you experienced over the last year in the world of touch? Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? So at, at the beginning of the pandemic, we we launched what we call the Safe Touch Initiative, right, which was a, a initiative to bring different kinds of technologies to make those touch experiences safer, right? We did that in a number of ways. We did, um, we launched antibacterial coatings, right? That would that would kill some basic germs that were on screens as a very simple way to, to at least bring some le level of protection to screens. Um, we did some, we worked with some outside companies to partner on um, anti, um, I don't know, antiviral coatings. I guess we we worked with them on actual developments that could kill coronaviruses, right? And and what that could look like. Um, and then we went off the screen, right? We started to play with touchless technology, right? So we launched something called AirTouch, which brought touch three centimeters off the screen, right? And brought basic functionality out into space. 
right? And and what we saw as time wore on is those were good, but they were a little bit like 3D techno- TV, mm. right? The simple answer was to have a bottle of hand sanitizer with you. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yep. Right. So we were we were creating technology solutions to problems that really might not be as substantial as as we thought they were at the outset. Now, that's not to say we as an industry shouldn't continue to push forward on how we can make a touch experience safer. Right. Mm-hmm. They are dirty devices. Right. If you put them in public access, you know, an average screen in a Kroger, let's say, is going to get 20 to 25,000 touches over the course of a day. Right. That's a lot of people stuff getting on those screens. Mm-hmm. Right. So what can we do to make those experiences safer? Yeah, exactly. Well, it makes you want to shrug, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. So so what can we do to make that safer? Yes, but the answer was really simple about carrying hand sanitizer. So it, it was a very, very strange dichotomy to walk through. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, where do I see this going forward? Um, I see that coming off the screen as continuing to be a rich way to experience a screen. Um, I think you're going to see that kind of morph into gestural based technologies, right? I think voice, we've shown that voice has some functionality. Um, I think we overstate what voice can do, right? I get more frustrated with Siri than I do with a lot of the people that are around me when I try to ask my phone to do certain things, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's going to be this convergence, right? And I've spent a lot of time in the last three to four months talking about convergence. How can we bring voice input technology, gestural input technology, touch technology, and make that a rich, full user experience, right? When we take the pros of all those things and blend them together, I think we're giving our con- our customers, our consumers, our constituents a much richer experience, right? Because touch is not going to go away. Right. We talked about handing somebody right a, a phone and asking him to dial. Right. The converse. Hand a child an iPad, mm-hmm. you know, hand an 18 month year old, an 18 month old an iPad, they know exactly what to do. It's how we interact with our world. Right. We touch it, we feel it. This is the way we do it. And what we've done with touch is we've made information as tangible as all of those physical objects around us. Think of the power of that. Think Mm -hmm. about what that enabled, right? Think about that paradigm shift that now that technology, that information, that content, digital content can be consumed in such a different way. Um, So that's where I see this kind of moving as we go off into 2022 and beyond. I'm interested to see how gestures, you know, the whole idea around gesture, mm-hmm. gesturing, how that's going to manifest itself, you know, not just in the screen, but in the environment. You know, I mean, we've seen stories of industry or warehouse, because obviously one of the areas that we play a lot in is the warehouse space and using gesture technology to facilitate commands, commu- computer right, commands right. and stuff like that. So um, it's good to, to hear that we're you're, that you're on top of it, right, Gene, that, you, that you're working with gesture technology as it would relate to um, talk to us a little bit there is it just gesturing around the screen or is it a space around the screen that 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 you're trying to envelope if you will it, it's a space around the screen right yeah. I don't think gestures close to the screen really bring the the same kind of richness right and and gestures are good for very large movements right mm-hmm. if I want to swipe to the next page right to be able to just bring my hand in front of the screen and swipe that that to me is a very good use of gestural input. Mm-hmm. If I try to do any fine movements with gesture, it's extremely frustrating, mm-hmm. right? If I try to type anything with gestures, if I try to type out in space, right, it's it's very frustrating. So I need touch to do that, right? If I yeah. want to call up a menu, voice is good for that, right? I can I can give a voice command to bring up a certain menu, and then either with gesture or with touch, I can manipulate that, right? That's so that's that convergence idea, not forcing a user into one particular user experience, but giving them the richness of, of all of those input technologies in a way that makes sense. And in many cases, having a keyboard attached, Mm -hmm. right? I've I've said for a long time, touch is a great content consumption device. Touch is a lousy content creation device. (laughs) Right. I like that. I like my daughter at university. She is not going to type a paper on her iPad. Right. Right. She needs her laptop to write a term paper. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So I think content creation and content uh, consumption are, are very different things and will be for a long time. Yeah, mm-hmm. man, I, I love that point. And you're so right, because, I, you know, I've, I've been an iPad person for you know probably a good decade now. I love using my iPad. But you're right. I do not want to type on my iPad. And mm-hmm. I, I like to write. I do a lot of typing. I've got one of those little, you know, you know, mm-hmm. keyboard cover things or whatever that's mm-hmm. attached to it that you, know, you flip it open, the Bluetooth kicks in and you type. I will I will take that kind of typing on my iPad every any day, day mm-hmm. over over actually t- 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 hunting pack, oh, no. you know, like. Yeah, Gene's right because my <laughs> yeah. kids, you know, college or high school, they if they're writing a paper, it's on a keyboard. Right. It, but you know what I think is funny though? The interesting the opposite side of that is interesting is I feel like the physical keyboards never really took off with phones though. Like when I or was or at least with like smartphones and touch mm-hmm. phones. Like when mm-hmm. I first my first smartphone was an Android, mm-hmm. like the Droid Two or whatever I think, and it had the slide out keyboard, the slide out yeah. QWERTY keyboard on the uh-huh. other side of it. And I and granted, I guess it's still not the same thing because you're not typing in the same way you type on right. a on a computer or a typewriter type, type keyboard. You still had to kind of do the thumb thing, mm-hmm. and I hated that keyboard. <laughs> Like I would still prefer to use the the keyboard on the screen rather mm-hmm. than that thing. So it, it's it's one of those things where you, you you figure out what your threshold is, and there's there's some places where something like that works, and some places it doesn't. Where you're like, okay, I will accept the the screen typing for this, but I won't accept it for my iPad. The phone, fine iPad, no. Don't you, know? you remember what was before that on the phone? If well, you were to type out a text, you had to hit the number. The T9 like, like, stuff? Y- yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Which, honestly, though, I was pretty good at that. Like, oh, I got I'm sure fast, you were. Like, I, I got to the point where like, I could do that without even looking. Like, <laughs> oh, I got man. fast at yeah, typing. Yeah, you were like a pro. That. Right. Okay. But then as soon as you gave me that slide-out keyboard, I was like, Ugh. I felt like some kind of <laughs> Neanderthal. I was like trying to punch the buttons, you know, it just didn't work out for me. Yeah. Uh, well, Gene, let's wrap up our main conversation here. Uh, you know, and, and I want to ask one more question about the world of touch. Are there any, any industries that you feel would benefit from touch technology that maybe aren't necessarily doing it right now or aren't doing enough of it and maybe some things that we don't really realize? Yeah, I think there anywhere that we can present information or opportunities for touch, right? And and I think where we're where we're not catching up yet is the richness that a multi-touch experience can can bring, right? I think a lot of industries have started to go into touch, right? I, I love the idea of medical, right? Our medical technology today, even from 10 years ago, is so vastly different, right, than than where it was. And and touch has been a part of that too, right? And and being able to look at at MRIs and other kind of X-rays in, in ways that we couldn't before to, to zoom in and things. But what we can do with multi-touch, right? What we can do with manipulating different things on the screen, I think is a piece of the puzzle that's missing. I'll take banking as a good example, right? Our ATM experience today is still very much the same as it's been for 25 years, 30 years, right? We've moved the buttons from the side of the ATM onto the screen, but we're still using single fingers to, to basically punch in, I want $50 from checking, right? <laughs> that could be transformed in some way, right? What that way looks like is where we're calling on the software community to say, look, we're giving you a toolbox of, of technology, right? Go into your spaces, figure out what you can do with that, right? Be creative in the ways that you could use that. Um, we worked with, with Pixar years ago to, to do a study of how quickly you could actually use a 10 key, right? Well, I'll date myself with a 10 key, right? So rest your rest your palm on a screen and actually type in like you were working at, at Walmart or something, but have your palm on the screen. And the you could pick up 30 to 40% more speed with a multi-touch system than you could with a single touch system because you could be touching the next number before your first finger went up, mm-hmm. right? Think right. if I'm Walmart. 30 to 40% faster on those kind of keying entries, mm-hmm. right? That is money. That is that is real ways to transform that experience in the store, right? So I think it's the software piece of this that can, that can continue to iterate. Um, there certainly are industries out there that are still very slow uh, to adopt, right? We just worked with a customer to put multi-touch screen onto fork trucks. Mm-hmm. Right? You guys are huge warehousing guys, right? Mm-hmm. You know, have your where you know, have your forklifts around, have actually a touchpad on there, 
right? Mm -hmm. What information could I get to the give to the forklift drivers if I had a display and a touch just like that person's phone, right? Sitting in the cockpit of the forklift, right? Yep. That would change how you would do that job, right? And there's just been this massive inertia, right? We talked about inertia at the outset of this, right? How do we overcome that inertia, right? Our learned behaviors, we love our comfort zones, right? So how do we push outside of that? How do we break that down? And, and it's just going to take time, right? It's, I feel like my job half the time is, is more evangelism than anything else, right? About <laughs> that this toolbox is really powerful guys, right? It can do so many things. We want to work with you. We want to help people realize the technology. We saw what happened when it happened to mobile phones, right? We saw the transformation in society that came from that shift, right? What we love to do and the biggest joy in my job is when I can do that with another customer in another industry to have them realize the same thing. Yeah. That's awesome. Preach it, Gene. I'm yeah, with you there. No doubt. Yeah. <laughs> because I think that, and I'm glad you, you, you touched on uh, multi-touch because I think that is one of the areas that we'll actually see a lot of growth. You yeah. know, I was reading about uh, the movement towards even larger screens that you can use collaboration. And, and Gene, I think you're, I thank you for illuminating in my mind that really it is the software community that needs to understand the power behind these types of technologies. I mean, the cost really has come down to a point where you know, a lot of times it's that's not the factor, whereas that maybe was the factor 10 years ago. You know, mm -hmm. the cost to implement touch technology maybe was a barrier. Not not so much today, you know, becoming much more ubiquitous. But it's incumbent upon the software developers, uh, solution providers to understand and think outside the box of what a large display that multiple people could touch on it, right. you know, like in the education space or in collaboration uh, when, when folks go, go back to work and mm -hmm. need a collaborative uh, type of an environment. Uh, it, it can have a dramatic impact there as well. Yeah, yeah pretty definitely. cool. Well, Gene, this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, you gave us exactly the kind of insight we were hoping for in the world of tech and society and how everything's interrelated. Uh, before we move on to our recurring segments, I want to, as always, thank our uh, sponsors for the Tech Connect podcast, Elo, Epson, Zebra, and Honeywell. We very much appreciate your support of our show. Uh, of course, if you want to support us even further, one of the best things you can do is, one, if you're watching us on YouTube, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, mm -hmm. turn on notifications. You'll always see when new episodes come out or when some of the other cool stuff that we do here at Blue Star uh, Tech Trivia, for instance. Right? Uh, Dean and I are hosting a trivia show every week <laughs> on Blue Star's YouTube we channel. We got webinars. Yeah, we got webinars. Yeah, we got all And all they have to do stuff. is hit the subscribe button. It's just that easy, isn't that it? That easy. Yeah. You get, you, right. and, and turn on those notifications so you get alerted every time we throw something out there or go live and Boom. you can check it out. Right. Uh, also, you can go on Apple Podcasts if you listen there. And I know a bulk of our downloads are come from Apple. Give us a five-star rating review. I know it sounds like a pain to do and it's tough time you don't want to take but seriously if you're listening and your phone's nearby just go to the show page go down to the bottom there's a little thing of stars you can just literally just tap that fifth star because yep. we know you're going to give us five stars and that's it you don't even have to leave a review if you want to leave a review great we'd love to we'd love to hear from you we maybe even read it on the show but just hit that five stars that's let us know that that, that you care and, and it makes our community bigger it, it, does. It, it, it opens it up to even more people being able to see it exactly so, yeah, there you go and of course as always if you want to reach out to us with any of your thoughts about how tech is shaving society the world of touch or any other questions you have or maybe some ideas for future episodes uh, you can find us uh, on twitter at tech connect pod and you can email us tech connect at bluestarinc.com All right, well, let's wrap up with our recurring segments. First of all, the value of the VAR. This conversation has been a little bit on the broad side today, but mm -hmm. I feel like we've touched on a few little things that can be useful for our VAR audience. So I kind of want to maybe, you know, dive into some of those. So, Gene, I'll start with you here. You know, how does understanding this relationship between tech and society add value to our VARs when it comes to their solution selling? You know, what, what does it mean to understand this world of tech and how we, you know, how we coexist with it and what works and doesn't work? I think, feel like we've kind of touched on this a lot, but, you know, let's boil it down to what can our VARs take away from this to help them when they go out and sell? Yeah, I think, I think a big part of it, right, is we, we've brought that generation out with technology now, right? So, so the, the generation that's entering the workforce right, both as employees and as consumers are, are very well versed in tech, right? So as we go out and we try to sell into these spaces, we have to acknowledge that the generation of consumers that we've created, and again, as employees that we've created, 
that's what they expect, right? So it's imperative on us to to look at that and say, okay, right? We need to we need to break free of that inertia, break free of those old ways that we're talking about, and recognize that this is going to be here, right? This is the status quo now. This is the the level that we're at, and we need to we need to offer that in all of our spaces, right? And then we need to look at the toolbox holistically right? What technology is out there? How can we bring them all together? I think the thing that we we harm ourselves with at times is, is saying, okay, we want to implement tech, but we don't look at it holistically. We pick a piece of tech that we like, and we let the other pieces kind of fall by the wayside and, and say they're not as important. And then when someone goes and tries to interact with our tech, they get frustrated, Right. Well, what's the worst thing you can do if someone gets frustrated with a touch experience, right? They're not going to look on the back of the screen and find out who it's from. They're not going to see who made that kiosk. They're not going to figure out who that, you know, who the technology was. They're going to think of the space that they're in. Let's say it's a store and they're going to have a negative impression of that store. Right. So your brand equity gets hit when you don't implement tech well. Right. Mm. So it's that holistic mindset because that is your brand identity. It's your brand equity that you're building up. And, and again, if the consumers are demanding it and your employees are demanding it, then it's imperative for us to be able to offer that in a meaningful way so the VARs can, can do a great job with it. Yeah. Bingo. I, like I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, when you think about it, right, we all live in the society. So you have to you have to bring that to the table and understanding that and relevant to the conversation that we've had today. Touch is an opportunity. Touch equals opportunity in the sense that it's not going away. Um, you know, in, in yes, it's a part of the way that our society uh, operates today. And I, I love the fact that Gene hit on the what I'll call the attitude of the youth. You know, you you do have generational at least here in the U.S., you have a generation that is coming up, coming to fruition, if you will, coming into their own, however you want to say mm-hmm. it. Um, they're going to influence the way that industries and uh, business, manufacturing, all of that operates. They have their disposition is different. You know, they're 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 comfortable with with technology. They're comfortable with privacy issues, whereas maybe you know older generations aren't. Some of those things are, are going to continue to change. But at the end of the road, when you think about opportunity. Opportunities, to me, touch is one of those opportunities. And sometimes you have to break outside of your box that you're in to understand where those opportunities lie. Add it to your tech stack. We talk yep. about tech stack around here all the time, but as a reseller, touch should, should be in your tech stack as at least a possibility. And it doesn't matter if you're a warehouse reseller or if you're in retail and hospitality, there are opportunities. There's going to be the need for that type of a solution uh, integrated at some point in time. So you might as well get up on what it is and how to implement it. Yeah. You know, I was I was reading something about healthcare related, and I, I, I don't remember who put it out, but they were talking about the idea that, you know, in healthcare, we do a lot of stuff with touch that's mm-hmm. related to customer facing. Mm-hmm. You know, when we as a patient show up, mm-hmm. you know, to potentially have t- touch screens that we can use in order to wayfind our way around the hospital or to check in for an appointment or something like that. Just, you know, various p- points where we as the patient want to have that. And that's great because, yes, you know, to to the point, it's something we're comfortable with. It's something we're used to. It gives us a positive experience that we get to use a piece of technology that we're already familiar with. But the, the what, what they were pointing out was, what about on the backside of things? Mm. Your employees, mm-hmm. healthcare workers, they like that stuff too. <laughs> They're running around with iPhones in their pockets. They use touch in other facets of their personal life. Why wouldn't you have that kind of technology for them? Why yeah. wouldn't why wouldn't it make sense for their computers and their monitors mm-hmm. to have touch in them as well? So that you know, Gene, you mentioned earlier, you could zoom in on an X ray or you know, quickly scan through some paperwork. Um, you know, you eliminate potential problems. You know, with with keying stuff in and errors, you know, that way, like, why mm. wouldn't you give that to him on that back end mm-hmm, also? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. The only other thing I was going to add is Dean, or Gene, rather, you mentioned, uh, I don't know why I keep saying Gene, Gene and Dean. Uh, <laughs> just, it's like your name sounds familiar. Right? Gene, you mentioned early on, I think very early on, this idea of, I think it's when we were talking about like the 3D TVs, for example, this idea of, hey, we've got a cool new piece of technology. Let's go figure out how to go out and sell it. Not realizing that, you need to be able to solve a problem of some sort. And I think that's a very important point for our VAR audience yeah, is good realizing point. like, hey, mm-hmm. just because some cool new technology comes along that you think is neat doesn't mean <laughs> you have to go run to your customer and try to push it on them and tell them they need this and they got to have this. 
it's got to solve a problem. There's mm. a reason why we call it solution selling. There's a reason why I always talk about solutions because you have to be walking in and saying, hey, I've identified some problems. I see where there's some potential issues, whether you've told me about them or not, or I've just seen it myself in your business that some technology can solve. Here's some cool new technology I think is going to help you out. Let me explain how that's going to how, how that's yeah, going to happen. Absolutely, you. Yeah. you have to be making that connection because if it's just, well, this is the neat new gadget. You want to buy this, right? Yeah. Most people are going to go, mm. no. What what do I need that for? You and know? why did I buy from you in the beginning? <clears throat> yeah, you know, exactly. it's like, oh, geez, yeah, You're really <laughs> missing the mark there. Yeah, okay. excellent point. I'll give you guys a good example on that, right? So if if I go back to 2009 right? Um, ebooks were just starting to come out, right? So we worked with Barnes and Noble because Barnes and Noble wanted to be first to market with an ebook reader, yep. right? So they brought out their first generation Nook, right? We talked about the Zoom before, right? A little bit like this. They brought out their first generation ebook reader and they put a capacitive, projected capacitive slider at the bottom of it. But they didn't get the tech right. And there was a whole bunch of latency in that. Right. So when you tried to slide, there was seconds. We're not talking milliseconds. We're talking seconds of latency in that. Mm. Right. And what happened when they released that and it got into consumers' hands, no one talked about how large Barnes and Noble's electronic ebook footprint was, how many titles you could get. Right. All of the things that Barnes and Noble built the business case around, the only thing they talked about was how poorly the technology was implemented. <laughs> right. And that can, and that can happen to our VARs too, right? That's why I think it's important in, in this notion of solution selling, right? If you do it poorly, people are going to only focus on the poor implementation. Absolutely. Right? And, it, and, and so it's imperative us, I like the tech stack idea, right? Mm -hmm. to, to look at all of those layers in the stack and treat them all equally. Because mm -hmm. if one of them goes bad, it doesn't matter if everything else in the stack is good, yep. right? The whole thing's right. gonna look like a, a problem. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So to the point where we were just talking about here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. Well, hey, let's wrap up with our favorite segment of the week. Uh, what's tech connecting with you? This is absolutely. where we get to take a moment to chat a little bit about a piece of technology, innovation, the world of science, just something that's caught our attention or is, has, you know, or something maybe we're actually using or playing with right now. Mm -hmm. So Gene, I'll start with you. What's tech connecting with you right now? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me lately is is the notion of autonomous vehicles, right? So what we're doing in the autonomous vehicle space and, and how we continue to push from the notion of semi-autonomous into this idea of fully autonomous vehicles, right? And and what that could mean, you know, tech and society, right? That That is very much a, a radical change for the way that we treat transportation as a society, right? And then the extension of that that is is a real ethical conundrum for me is when things go bad with an autonomous vehicle how are those decisions going to be made right think about a horrific situation you're going to get into a crash right the car now has to decide are they going to crash and put the driver at risk of death or are they going to crash and put pedestrians at risk of death mm -hmm. where does that ethical decision get made Mm -hmm. Right. That's not getting made in the morality of the driver now. It's getting made by a company in code. Yeah. Right. So when we talk about this notion of tech and society and, and what is that going to look like moving forward, this notion of autonomy and, and AI and where that goes, I just find both fascinating and and disturbing in a lot of ways. Right. Yeah. And I think it's imperative again on on us as an industry to to wrestle through those, know where that end game lies, but uh, but I think it's something that we need to think about. Yeah. We do, uh, you know. We think we talk about autonomous vehicles on here all the time, yeah. And and it's that level five nirvana right. where when right. do we reach level five truly autonomous? And and when you think about the decision making tree, it's like oh boy, we're never going to get there. Yeah. How are you going to code in morality? I mean, right? Uh, it's well, it, I mean, it is fascinating. Gene. Philosophers have been grappling with that was the trolley car concept or whatever yeah, right like they've been grappling yeah. with that that concept for ever ever you know, for the <laughs> you know the existence of humanity is you know is it better to serve the needs of the one or the many kind of thing mm -hmm. you know and yeah and yeah and how do you i mean let's be honest we've 
we've learned, especially in the last couple of decades, that letting tech companies make moral decisions can be a very slippery slope yeah. in so many ways. Yeah. And yeah, and to your point, yeah, it's I feel like I feel like autonomous vehicles is one of those things, kind of like we were talking about with the iPhone earlier, where you you there's there's occasional technologies I feel like pop up every few decades or so mm-hmm. that just utterly change the world as we know it in some mm-hmm, way. And, mm-hmm. and I feel like, you know, that kind of in-your-pocket touch technology, the mobile smartphone was one of those things that just mm-hmm. has changed the way the entire world functions in some mm-hmm. way. I think autonomous vehicles could be the yep. next one. Right. I mean, there's always something that could pop up that, you know, does yeah. it also that we just aren't expecting or realize. You mentioned but, it. AI would be another one of those, yeah, but go exactly. ahead. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. but yeah. I think that's one of those ones where if we get it and we get it right and it works the way it's supposed to, the whole world just suddenly changes in oh, a different yeah. way. Yeah. But yeah. getting there you're, to Gene's point is the is the concern. A lot of wrestling. And, yeah. Man, there's just there's so many ang- I wouldn't want to be someone in that industry. That's all I can say. Like I I you know, the tech side of it is awesome, but as soon as that ethical side gets introduced, that's where you just go, Oh, I don't I don't know what to do with this at this point. It's so <laughs> it's so difficult. How do you how do you how do you tell a car to decide? Yeah. How do, how do you make a car decide who lives and who dies? Hey Gene, are you like tapped into any associations or stuff like that that are grappling? with these these decisions or anything that you could anything not, that you could tie not us at into? this point no, no. Yeah, and, okay. and i mean we're we're getting pushed a lot on the touch front in in the automobile right so again what what tesla did with with showing what can be done and and let's face it that that has its own set of challenges and, sure. and ethics right you know it for you to engage with the touch screen your eyes are not on the road mm-hmm. right so as we're pulling ourselves to want to produce to provide more content on the center console and do more things with that touchscreen, our eyes are not engaged on driving the vehicle, right? So you've got that balancing act. The yeah. ethics again come into it, right? That's it's good, but what you know, what catastrophic thing is right over there beyond the horizon that we worry about, yeah. right? So it's 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 this fine fine balancing act, right? And I do feel like. This notion of autonomous vehicles, I completely agree with you. It it feels a lot like the iPhone, right? Mm-hmm. It feels a lot like one of those major paradigm shifts that technology can enable that will fundamentally alter what it looks like. Do we own cars anymore? Don't we own cars? Are they just? I mean, what what does our world look like in the world of an autonomous vehicle? Right? It's I, I just find it fascinating, right? I think there's so many threads that you can pull on on that one that. It's, oh, I know. It's just a great field to stay close to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. No doubt about it. Dean, what's tech connecting with you? How about week? a battery that would last 28,000 years? You interested? I'm, I'm down for that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can I get it in my iPhone? Is it, <laughs> is it small? <laughs> what if What if I then had to tell you, well, the way we're going to power that is through nuclear waste? You still okay, good? No, no. Oh, no. did I lose you? Well, <laughs> no. Yeah, probably. Oh. I mean, I'm, let me just put it this way. I have to start thinking about it now. <laughs> There is a company out there, this is pretty cool, called Nano Diamond Battery that has okay. developed batteries that can run on nuclear waste. So when you think about all the upside here, right, we've got this, what do we do with all of our nuclear waste? You, you know, you think about the clean technology and all that kind of right, good stuff. Right. Well, they've literally found a way to do that, make it safe for humans, but it's like this endless little engine, you know, of nuclear waste. I forget how exactly they make it work. You know, it gets into some science that is carbon-14 radio soaps and, and, and how right, it interacts right, right. and stuff like that. So I'm not going to go there, but they have figured it out. And and the company, I think, is going public very soon. It's called, again, Nano Diamond Battery, but they basically create batteries that can last 28,000 years based on that, nuclear I mean, is that waste. like a Half ti- half life of some kind of. I ice don't know why it's twenty eight thousand. <laughs> it has I, to be. It has to be. I feel right? like it has to be like a you know, plutonium half life or but, something like but that. But their nirvana is like if we keep transportation the way it is right now, you you would buy a new car, yes, but the battery goes with you because it's going to last, you know. 28,000 right, years, right. so it doesn't matter. Right. You know, So you just take your battery with you, put yeah, it into buy, the new device. You buy one $20,000 battery that you get to use bingo. for the rest of your life. Right, yeah. And so instead of an education here, <laughs> here's your graduation battery that's going to last you the rest <laughs> yeah, of like, Are you life. here to finance your home loan, your car loan, school? No, I'm here to finance my battery. Yeah, yeah, my nuclear waste <laughs> battery. But I do think it's fascinating. So I, I thought that was kind of cool. Kind of cool. Nuclear yeah. waste. There you go. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, that's what's right. tech connecting with me. Okay. What about you? What about you? You know, I didn't really this is one of those days when I just didn't think too far ahead of time, didn't have something written down already. So I'm just going to throw out the vaccines. Yeah, all right. Because I, you, I know you just got your second one recently. Yep. Mine's coming up. Gene, you have yours coming up later today, I believe you said. 
I, I'm still just amazed at how quickly we managed to make this happen. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, we talked on, I think back on our remote work episode, we talked about how 20 years ago, the idea of shifting to remote work would have been a disaster. Oh, disaster. We would have never been able to do it the way yeah. we've done it now. No. And that probably would have accelerated and made the pandemic even worse. Even worse. Or we would have had more people that were out of jobs. And, yeah, the and economy would have tanked yeah. even more. You know, yeah. we, you know, I, you know, there's never a good time to have a pandemic, but I suppose <laughs> 2020 and where we are with technology was as good as it was going to get for the moment. Again, still, you know, as we mentioned earlier, you know, laying mm-hmm. in the foundation that a lot of people still didn't get to do what, what could have been done and, and we, we couldn't be as safe as we wanted. But but on the back end of that, I am amazed always and fascinated. I know I'm not going to get into the story of the mRNA and all that stuff, you know, because you can find stuff about that. We've been hearing about it for mm-hmm, months now, mm-hmm. but it still just amazes me that we went from, you know, early 2020, figuring out there's this pandemic, you know, that's, that's spreading across the world and we're all going to be, you know, our lives are going to be messed up because of it too. Now, just over a year later, we're all getting shots on our arms that hopefully will get us back to normal within the next year or so yeah. and get us back yeah. to where life was before. I think it's a it's an, uh, an amazing story about science and innovation and technology and the kind of people who are out there every day making stuff happen uh, under unexpected yeah. and high pressure situations. Yeah, and yeah. I like that last part there because I was watching another you know story on where we how we've gotten to where we are, but also this is just the beginning. By the way, yeah. there are some people out there that are working on I guess I'll call it Corona coronavirus vaccine period over all coronaviruses nice. so and in in this guy was like yeah within five years you know forget about the covid covid vaccine you're going to get vaccinated on the whole category of coronaviruses right, so right. they'll all they want to take it off the table so we'll never have a coronavirus pandemic ever again kind of like what so, we do with flu essentially now oh you know? yeah. but all of them are gone the common cold and all these viruses var mars whatever mars. <laughs> all, all the different <laughs> what do they call it mers, MERS uh, yeah, yeah. yeah all of those coronaviruses just taken off the table yeah. because of the one vaccine that they're going to develop it's like this super vaccine so i'm with That's you dude amazing. it's it is unbelievable what's happening there yeah yeah it's great you know that, again a, a great example of how technology has influenced society and the things mm-hmm. we can do when we when we actually put our mind to it. There so, you go. Yeah. Gene, thank you so much for being on the show today. We very much appreciate your insight and your help. Thank you guys for the opportunity. It was a, it was a great conversation. Look forward to it again. Yeah, Thanks, definitely. Gene. But unfortunately, it is time for us to unplug. So until next time, for Dean Reverman, I'm John Martin. Stay connected. Every industry wants devices that are secure and keep data private. But that's even more important in government. Data security via encryption is a standard part of every code product, hardware, and software, but they take it a step further with a series of FIPS-validated solutions, taking robust encryption to the next level. Additionally, this validation qualifies those products as government-approved for use in their facilities. Using government-tested and approved cryptography for data transmission, the code FIPS-validated CR2700 scanners, cradles, and remote management software are perfect for your public sector partners. In addition to the usual disinfectant-ready housing, IP65 protection, smart batteries, and much more. To learn more, check out the link in the show notes or contact your Blue Star Code rep. Zebra is reinventing companion scanners with its new CS60 series, the ultra-versatile scanner with a first-of-its-kind design to adapt to any workflow. Easily convert between corded and cordless operation, handheld and hands-free as business needs change. Regardless of what's purchased up front, users can change modes at any time for superior investment protection. Easy to charge, pair, and configure, the CS60 series is ready for mobile scanning, checkout counters, kiosks, and more. It's also available in a purpose-built healthcare model. To learn more, check out a video overview and find plenty of helpful sales tools. Check out the show notes or contact the Zebra Blue Star team.